What did you learn last week? Anybody want to speak out? What did you learn last week? One thing, just a sentence or two. Okay, what have you been talking about right now when I ask you to talk to your neighbor about what you learned? Yes. Christ is at the center, okay. The difference between secular psychology and biblical psychology, biblical counseling. Uh, Kim? Oh, good. Wisdom from above. Remember that portion? Anybody remember where that is in the Bible? James chapter 3. Is there a difference between wisdom below and the wisdom above? What's the primary difference? God. Really. God. Is God a wise God? Yes, he's a wise God. Without God, do I have wisdom? Yes, I have wisdom from below. Am I clever? Okay, am I clever? Am I capable? Am I smart? Am I capable? Am I a good problem solver? I might be, but I am also, there is a difference between the wisdom above and the wisdom below. Do you remember that portion? It's a key portion. We could speak on it really all summer, all semester. Okay, Tom? Okay, the different, one of the differences is there, our viewpoint, how we see things, and to see them from an eternal viewpoint, from a spiritual viewpoint. Uh, okay, one more. Anyone? Pardon? Rooted in Christ, Rooted in Christ yeah. Uh, is biblical counseling for everybody? It is, but does everybody have a capacity for it? They don't. They, if they're not a believer, how can they build their life on believing in God if they have no faith in God, right? If they don't have the Holy Spirit, how can the Holy Spirit uh, really impart to them on a consistent basis the truth? Correct? So... Biblical counseling isn't for everybody, but we can give it to everybody. But it may not, it may fall on deaf ears or people with very little capacity to hear it and relate to it. Okay, uh, before we start the class, I want to ask you a question. <clears throat> Have you ever tried to change an area in your life? You have? Do you want to share it publicly? <laughs> Have you ever tried to change an area in your life and you've succeeded? Mm -hmm. Okay. Would you talk to your neighbor about it for a moment and be very cautious and careful about what you say? Okay. Might be good for you to say something a minute or two. Have you ever tried to change an area in your life? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, behavior, bad habit, addiction, yeah. Um, way of thinking, yes. Okay. Okay, next question. How many of you, just a show of hands, how many of you tried to change an area of your life, maybe a bad habit or something that you did, maybe uh, you just were able to do it? How many changed a way, some area in your life and you succeeded? Raise your hand. Quit smoking. Stop taking drugs. Okay. Brought your weight down, Oliver. Yeah, all right, so uh, of course uh, this can happen, and we're happy for good changes. Uh, and um, I want to kind of go through a couple principles, and I don't want to do it like last week. There was a lot of material, and uh, I'm going to try to be a little more slower and take a little more time 
and also we'll take a break too. Last week we said, and this is just a general breakdown, people that have problems and needs in their life. The first one is encouragement, that people are looking for love and security. And um, uh, sometimes their problems are not very deep, but they just generally want to be recognized. Do you know their name? Are they accepted in the group? Um, do you love them? Do you accept them? And that is one kind of counseling. And in the body of Christ, there's a lot of counseling that goes on. That's why I'm very happy that you're here in Bible college, because in this environment of uh, church life, there is spiritual life, there are gifts of the Spirit, there is wisdom, and there is love that is just uh, given out without partiality. More deeply is number two, teaching. Uh, people need it, uh, and they need a deeper understanding about life. But where can I find it? And really, it's only God that really knows the person. 1 Corinthians 2, 11. Would you turn there, please? <clears throat> I will give you pastors, shepherds after my own heart in Jeremiah 23, in verse 5. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 11. What man knows the things of a man? save the spirit of a man which is in him. Even so, the things of God knows no man but the spirit of God. Do you see that? Chapter 2, verse 11. Okay. Means not even your mother really knows you. They, the, your mother knows you, but really the, the organ that is used in knowing a person is his spirit. And nobody knows the spirit of a man but God, because God is spirit. And then we know one another in the spirit, uh, and that's why the teaching is deep and understanding is deep. We are really changed by our understanding. Ephesians 1, 17 and 18, when you understand um, it's enlightenment, Psalm 19. Real change happens by mentally understanding. You know, we'll talk about it later, but uh, when the mind understands, there's a, uh, um, a deep appreciation. There is a connection with us. Understanding is a big part of life. And counsel must be um, like deep water um, in Proverbs 20, verse 5. And a man of understanding will draw it out. So that's number two. That's a kind of counsel that is a biblical counsel that goes to the heart and spirit of a man. Remember, I noticed I said heart and spirit. They go together. Ezekiel 36, 26. There are some terms that just write them down, and maybe you have questions, and it'll be repeated, and this will build a system of understanding uh, with a congruency, uh, and you'll see as time goes on. Number three, specialized problems that people have. Uh, they come to you for help. And we can call them stubborn problems, not easily going away. Uh, some people wrestle with problems for years. Uh, but it is uh, uh, a great joy to see people change. And in time, and by God's grace, and by embracing uh, truth, uh, Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Uh, some of them, addictions, eating disorders, depression, uh, victims of sexual abuse, and others. Um, 
and uh, maybe trauma, and just there's a whole list of them. We'll go over that too in the, this semester. In our class, it's a two-hour class, so I'll do one hour teaching, we'll take a break, and then um, we, we have some people coming in and speaking about special problems. Uh, Pastor Dan Lightsey on addictions, Pastor Hadley on marriage and uh, financial counsel, too. Uh, that'll be important. And so uh, that's how our semester will go. But let's lay the foundation of what we're teaching. So you got that. We said that in secular psychology, uh, there is uh, there are the theory builders, the credentials for being counselors. Um, there's a mental health system. Uh, that is based on secular psychology, journals, and books. Um, secular psychology really started by Sigmund Freud and all of the, the students and the studies and the theories and the therapies, and, and uh, there's been a lot of work done, and that is the most popular in our culture, uh, secular psychology. And it, it's an interesting study, and encourage you to uh, do some of this independently and find out what are the secular psychologists saying about themselves? What are the results of their therapies? What are the results of their th theories? Uh, what, what is really happening in the world of psychology? Uh, is there a, a lot of confidence in it? Is it really working? Or do they feel they are succeeding? And you know what is happening in that world? That's not the subject of our class, but it's something for you to take note of. The second thing is <clears throat> counseling. Uh, I had here, okay. Oh, well, let's go back to this, the other one. <clears throat> the traditional church or liberal church is uh, really, I think I lost my, it is, oh, thank you, okay. The uh, traditional church or non-Bible believing church, uh, liberal theologians have left the inerrancy of the Bible. Do you know what inerrancy means? Inerrancy means that uh, we believe the original writings of the scripture called the autographs were divinely inspired and there was not any error in them. There was no error in the content of the intention of the content and of a word. There is no mistake in a, a Greek or a Hebrew word in what are called the autographs. The autographs are, we do not have them. They, they are, we only have copies of the autographs, manuscripts in the tens of thousands. From these uh, manuscripts, we have our translations. My translation, I do not say the, the English translation is inerrant, but I know and I, well, I believe that the autographs are inerrant without any error. They are divinely inspired. Second Peter 1 and verse 21. This is a demarcation point with liberal theologians and fundamentalists. Fundamentalists are taking the view that the Bible is inerrant. And I think you understand that, so at least you're, going to, you're learning it. And my, philosophically, my view is this, that if the Bible is, like, here's my head, my brain, my intelligence, my understanding, and the Bible is subject to me, then, then I'm losing an authority that I need as a man who is uh, totally depraved. I am unable, left to myself, to determine and decipher truth. 
The Catholics, on the other hand, by Thomas Aquinas' theology, believes that man fell but not his reason, and that by reason he can find God. But we believe we're totally depraved, and I, I by my reason cannot find God and cannot find truth, absolutely. It must be revealed to me. So my Bible, in my view, is this way. It's above me. I cannot criticize it. I'm not finding fault with it by my uh, scholarship and by my research. And of course, some of the uh, major theologians of the 20th century have done that. And they have found, you know, what their arguments. And I have read some of that, but I cannot find it to be uh, philosophically reasonable uh, to have the Bible subject to me. If God was to speak to me, his word would be above me, and I, he would give me a canon of Scripture that would be the primary authority for my life. Of course, why wouldn't he? I mean, I just can't uh, uh, see it any other way. So um, the... The liberal theologians have a more uh, secular psychological orientation to life, not much different from what is uh, propagated in the world. But the uh, Bible believer has uh, the Bible, we have the Holy Spirit, we have God himself, we have the body of Christ and the gifts of the body. And uh, now we have what is called biblical counsel. And uh, 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 <laughs> let me give you the, the uh, three things that I know now because I have a Bible that speaks to me. Number one, <clears throat> knowing God up on the screen, knowing God, God is at the center. We have the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, wise pastors, Jeremiah 23, 5. We have the body of Christ, and we have eternal direction and provision. You got that? So I'd like to turn to Proverbs or Jeremiah, please. Chapter twenty-three. Twenty-three, verse four. I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more. Meaning the people. Jeremiah twenty-three, verse four. I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them. They shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Okay, well, there it is. Okay, that's what I was saying before. And these are the three things that you know now because you have the Bible. You have God, you have the Bible. Number one, uh, knowing God. Knowing God. Jeremiah chapter 9. Oh, it's great to be in here. Oh, it's amazing. Look at Jeremiah 9, 23, 24. Do you see it? Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understands and he knows me. Now that's a very powerful statement, isn't it? That I would know God. I mean, isn't that awesome? That I would understand him and I would know him. This is what we glory in. 
and that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Number two up on our screen is knowing man. Who is man? How is he made? Who knows a man? What is a man? I think people are the most fascinating things on the earth, aren't they? Well, the, the beauty of commitment, the beauty of love, morality, uh, I just, um, you know, have you ever noticed like out in the wild when the, like uh, there was a, a great white, uh, great white shark that uh, killed a man in South Africa and they located it and they were going to destroy the shark. And the widow, the wife of the man that was uh, disappeared, presumably eaten by the shark, she pleaded that they wouldn't kill the shark, you know? And that, that whole thing like is fascinating to me, uh, that if in the law of Moses, if your ox uh, kills, uh, somebody, then, then you kill the ox. And this is in the law of Moses. But I'm sure the people in South Africa are not thinking about the law of Moses, but they're thinking with the law written in their heart, Romans 2, 14 and 15. And then for the widow to plead because she believes, you know, that nature and the animal should be living, and so on, and she has a conscience. So uh, this is number two. Knowing man, knowing total depravity, knowing he is made eternally, that he is spirit, and he is also flesh, and the complexities of his mind, and the three words that we use a lot here, do you remember the words? Guilt, fear, and what's the third one? Shame. Where are these words taken from? Where are they taken from? Guilt, fear, shame. Genesis chapter 3 after they sinned, the man hid himself, and he said, I was afraid. I hid myself. Um, he also uh, defended himself. He said, the woman you gave me, gave me to eat. It was a uh, tactic of self-defense to blame the woman and blame God. The woman you gave me, you see, uh, so, number three, what, what the, uh, the average person doesn't have, these three things, they don't know God, they don't know man, and they don't know the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, and the body of Christ. They don't know the Holy Spirit, the Word of God. They go out and talk to somebody in the street and ask them, you know, hand them the Bible and say, could you find the Gospel of Matthew for me? You know, they can't, they, they don't even, they, they don't know. All right, so they may read the Bible, but do they have the word? Is the word, do they know it? Has, has it touched them? And the answer is no. So here are three things that are very important in counsel in regards to helping people deeply, and that is that uh, you know God, you have the Bible, and you also have an understanding of people. You are a student of people. You honor people, respect people, think about people, study people, love people, read about people, understand fallen nature, understand redemption, understand victorious living. It's awesome, isn't it? Okay. All right.
Next thing. A general understanding of man's need for deep change. I believe people need to have a deep change. At the beginning of the class, I asked how many of you changed an area in your life? And you raised your hands, right? And I wonder what those things were that you changed. Maybe you don't watch television as much. Maybe you quit smoking. Maybe there was something that happened, you know, that you had some change in your life. But I, I, I want to also say that even though people can change on one level, there is something that they cannot do. And that is they cannot have a deep change in their life without God. And with God, there are the, the deepest and the most fundamental change happens in a person's life. And this is where biblical counseling takes off. Now, there's an organization called Teen Challenge. Anybody hear of it? Or you've been in it, maybe? Or you've heard about it by David Wilkerson? It's a rehab ministry for addictions and the, your life changes. They have like an 88% of success rate. With the rehab programs that are in the world, there's something like a 15% uh, success rate. And the numbers are very much like this. They may be a little different depending on studies and surveys and, and maybe the latest ones. But basically, the success rate of Teen Challenge as an organization is amazing. And one of the reasons is because God is in it. And because this is their philosophy of approaching people, it is through Christ. Listen, maybe you get off drugs, but if you, if you don't have the deepest type of change in your life, the one that God gives you through Christ, uh, then really it's in, a, in, a, in an absolute sense, it's in vain. Okay, uh, this one. So let's stop there for a second because uh, I want to not go so fast. So, any question or comment? Mm -hmm. Okay. Turn to uh, Second Corinthians just for a few more minutes. Second Corinthians five. Verse 14, the love of Christ constrains us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. How are we all dead? How is everybody dead? In which way? How are we all dead? Um, be in sin. We're all dead. Yeah, we died in Christ, it's true. But all human beings are dead to God. They have no relationship with God. We're all dead. We're all sinners. Isaiah 59, verse 2, our sin has separated us from God. And so we are all dead. If Christ died, we can say it this way. Yeah, some people say, you know, any religion will work if you just are committed to it. Uh, if you are Muslim, Hindu, whatever you are, just if you are sincere and following that religion, you know, God will understand. What does God say about it? That Muhammad and all of these teachers and all these religious leaders were always all dead also. That we're all dead. And if, if there was a way by some other person, then... Why would God send his only son? But if he sent his only son, then everybody is dead. 
Nobody can stand before a living God. No one has eternal life. Nobody can make it. So it, it required God to give his son. And in giving his son, he's making a statement that all of us are lost. All of us are dead. Uh, verse 15. And that he died for all, that they which live should not live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Let's say that together. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. What does that mean? Knowing no man after the flesh means that I don't know people any longer based on the first birth or the flesh of man. If you look at this um, diagram here, we say it this way, that the world that the average person is living in is this one. Um, this is the world of uh, man. This is the world of time and space. This is where people have experiences in the first story of the house of God's reality. This is a house of God's reality. And there is where people live. And they've all, they're all dead. And there's no man can, that can make it out of his death. He can never save himself, never find salvation, never find God ultimately relationally yes god can visit an unbeliever by his anointing and he can speak to his heart and he does speak to these people all of them but they cannot get beyond the first floor of the house they cannot find the reality they cannot find the way the truth the life they cannot find christ god they cannot find a new life. They cannot find a deep change. They can go from one kind of, um, you know, they can go from one type of living and, and there could be a change only in this first floor, but not a deep change because all are dead. And now, because in Christ we are made new, now we don't know each other in this limited way of the first floor, but now we are in the whole house. We are, in, we are in Baltimore City, and we are also in heavenly places. We are now in the whole house. And I don't know you based on your past life. I know you based on your new birth. I don't know you based on your problems. I, ba I know you based on the new life. I know you based on what Jesus did. Isn't that amazing? It is, it is, it is amazing. Look at it. It says it in verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Wow. What does that mean? I'm beyond the first floor of the building. I'm a new creature. You could draw my, me like this, in the, you and I in the picture this way, like we are here and we are also here. We are, we are more than just our, our natural life. We are born of God. We are spirit. We have Christ's heart and Christ's mind. We have our new life. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Now he has uh, all that is needed in his heart and mind for that entirely new life of understanding those three things that we mentioned earlier. I know God. I know man. And I know what God is saying to me by the Holy Spirit. I know God. I know man more than I knew him before. 
I understand who he is. I understand his potential both for evil and bad, and I understand his potential for God. I know what grace is, and I also I know what the word is saying. I know what the finished work is. I know what the kingdom of God is. And that's the, uh, the gift, the new way of counseling now. Do you see? This is now opens to us a what, what is called biblical counseling. It uh, takes certain theological understanding and spiritual experience and skill uh, to lead people in a counseling that has an amazing impact. And maybe some of you uh, will work in a mission someplace helping people who have addictions. Maybe some of you will pastor. Some of you will be a pastor's wife or helper or team member or missionary. Biblical counseling is amazing. It changes people and leads them in the deeper life. It is real change. Biblical counseling happens amongst us in the pulpit and then also one-on-one -on -one in council. We'll finish with that one because uh, I wrote that down here. Uh, it might be in this book. Let's see. Uh, so, let's see. Sorry. This really covers all of what I just said. I mean, let me see. Um, biblical counseling is okay. It's amazing. What did I? Do? What was I just thinking? I, I wish I knew that. It's a, biblical counseling. Yeah, the pulpit. There were there were like the three. Yeah, the pulpit. You see, here's another thing. The the um, we'll we'll take our break in a second. The biblical counseling. There is the general fellowship in the body. Oh, I know now. Number one. You, you, here, here's a good thing about your life. You might say, Pastor, I don't really know that I have anything. I don't really have any major problems in my life or anything. Will there be any changes going on in my life? What's the answer to that? There'll be maturity. There'll be a maturing, going in a goal. There's a direction. Really, it happens. But you may not notice it in your life. And some of you that are new here in Bible college, you have a long, you need to recognize that God, God will help you in your study, your concentration. Like we said last night in the service, that was an amazing service last night, very unique in some ways, and how God wants me to have a personal relationship with my Bible. And God is going to speak to us and lead us specifically. So we have counsel. Biblical counseling comes in general fellowship. It comes in the pulpit ministry. This is it's amazing. And it's Psalm 62, verse 11. Okay. Anybody know what that verse says? What's that? Yes, God has spoken once, and I heard it twice. Say that with me. God has spoken once, and I heard it twice. What does that mean? Let's read it. Turn there. Psalm 62, 11. God has spoken once, twice have I heard this. Power belongs unto God. Why does it say that? God has spoken once, and twice I heard it. Why is that? Anybody know? Yes, Kevin? Okay. It, it comes to you when you read your Bible by yourself. And then when you go to the church and you hear it, you're hearing it a second time, and it's from the pulpit. The pulpit ministry will confirm for you your personal study. 
And you need to hear it twice. Not just from the pulpit. You need to hear it in your own private, personal life. How many of you are reading the Bible? Okay, you're in Bible school. Okay, don't do it because you're in Bible school. Do it because the Holy Spirit is leading you in it. And I'm, I'm telling you, it's like just read it. And, and even if you don't understand it, pray and read and work at it and read your Bible. It's amazing. There'll be, it'll go like this, a part of the Bible which kind of speak to your heart and you'll park there for a while. Write it on an index card. You know those uh, little markers that you can wash off? I had the idea, I haven't done it, in, in, but I had the idea to write it on the windshield of my car, a Bible verse that I want to memorize for the day. Why wouldn't I do that? I'm driving my car, I can see it on the windshield of my car, and then you spray the alcohol on it and wipe it off and put the next verse on the next day. What about that idea? What about index cards? What about posters in your bedroom with a Bible verse on it? Many times in my newborn Christian life, I had one Bible verse, and I'd pull it out of my pocket, and there I had it. Okay, once he spoke, but he uses two different ways. Twice I heard it. Once in my heart, in the closet, on the windshield, the index card, in my prayer room, and then I heard it from the pulpit too. And that wedded, that, that word got, you know, that word got in my heart and became part of the counsel that I needed. Now, Sunday's message about dads and about marriages, on Sunday, I got a phone call from Tennessee. The woman heard it on the internet. She said, I totally was corrected by that. And I changed. I was driving my car to see my husband, and it was going to be over. But I totally changed on it because I heard, and, and, and she said, God really spoke to me. Not her conscience, but more than her conscience, but God spoke to her. Okay, and then uh, the counselor in the counseling room, I hear it. Okay? The counselor in the counseling room, John Hadley, Pastor Hadley, sitting in his office. When you're sitting in his office, you get a little nervous. And you go, oh, no. Oh, no. So I have a counseling session. And it can be in the garden. It could be at a cafe. It could be in an office. But one-on-one, -on -one, and the man is a man of God. He's very careful with his words. He listens, and he listens more to, he hears what you say, and he listens to what's behind what you are saying. And we'll talk about that, and we'll have Pastor Hadley come in and also speak on that subject as well. So those are three different ways that you receive counseling for a deep change. The deep change that has happened because you're a born-again believer, but you, need, you are being progressively sanctified you know that principle you almost, we're almost done progressively like last week we just kept going progressing you're like ah oh, just one more thing ah oh, progressively sanctified you know so, oh, i just want a coffee that's all oh one more illustration oh no one more bible verse okay all right, so there it is, progressively sanctified. I am being changed deeply. Thank you, Jesus, from glory to glory. Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, okay? Take your, uh, uh, it'll be 15 minutes, it's very generous, 14 minutes, it's like very, very generous of me. But you have a lot of time, like 14 minutes, and then, Come back, we'll start right at that time, and, um, and then we'll get, you know, that's it. We're going to go for it, okay? Okay. 